Uh, Dr. Hamilton, of course, contributed to improvement of working conditions for all people, but I think she was especially interested in, in women who were, at that time, beginning to enter some of the more hazardous trades. Uh, first, of course, she was a role model for uh, educated professional women such as herself who wished to pursue careers in academia and public service. She made significant inf inroads in these areas. And secondly, she campaigned extensively for improvements in working conditions experienced by women in all strata of society. Uh, it is for these reasons that the, today's event is co-sponsored uh, by the Women's Bureau. Uh, Dr. Ann Bookman from the Women's Bureau uh, is an authority on family and employment issues. Uh, she recently joined the, the department where she is serving as special assistant to the director and as the policy and research director of the Women's Bureau. Prior to her appointment, Dr. Bookman worked as both a scholar and an activist on working women's issues. As an anthropologist trained in cross-cultural child development, she has conducted research on children, families, and women's work in East Africa and the United States. She is editor of Women and the Politics of Empowerment, which documents women's workplace and community organizing efforts throughout the United States. She's published articles on women and unionization, family and medical leave, child care, and other family workplace policies. Her knowledge of these issues is drawn from interviews with a diverse cross-section of working women in her native Massachusetts, as well as her own experiences as a working mother, as a blue-collar worker, and union activist. She worked as a coil winder in an electronics company, which she helped to unionize with the uh, United Electrical Workers. And later, as a machinist at General Electric Company, she helped to organize a women's committee in IUE, Local 201. And she, she was among the founders of Boston's first chapter of the Coalition of Labor Union Women. Dr. Bookman also served in state policymaking decisions. She was a gubernatorial appointee to the Special Commission on Parenting Leave and the Commission on Temporary Disability and Dependent Care Insurance. She also served on the Governor's Daycare Partnership Task Force. Dr. Bookman received her bachelor's degree from Barnard College and holds a PhD in soci social anthropology from Harvard University. Her academic career has included teaching, research, and administrative positions at the Bunting Institute of Radcliffe College, at Wellesley College, and most recently at the College of the Holy Cross. This morning, uh, Dr. Bookman will discuss Alice Hamilton and the issue of working women. Anne. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, first of all, I just want to bring greetings to you from Karen Nussbaum, director of the Women's Bureau, who really regretted that she couldn't be here in person. Um, the Women's Bureau is very pleased to be co-sponsoring this event with OSHA, and Karen has asked me especially to express her thanks to Joe Deere and to the staff of OSHA for initiating, I think, this wonderful and important opportunity to celebrate and remember Alice Hamilton. I first learned about Alice Hamilton 10 years ago when I was asked to give a talk on some of my work at GE at the Alice Hamilton Symposium on Women in Occupational Health, organized by women from the Harvard School of Public Health. During that day-long conference, we learned about Hamilton's many contributions to industrial toxicology in particular and to the broader field of occupational health. We looked at her career not only to rediscover what she had painstakingly discovered and documented in workplaces across America, but also to look at her place in a generation of women who were pioneers both in their professions and in the social reform movements of their times. Alice Hamilton was truly a pioneer in occupational health, as you've heard. Her success in a male-dominated field inspired and paved the way for other women, as Barbara Sisherman said in her biography of Hamilton, quote, she went straight to the center of the male world, the laboratory, the factory, Harvard. Her work exposed her to adventures at odds with 19th century definitions of womanhood. In her search for poisonous dusts, she jumped on tabletops, climbed dangerous catwalks, and descended deep into mine shafts clad in overalls." Unquote. I think those are wonderful images for us to hold in our mind this morning. Alice Hamilton was also involved in many of the social reform movements of her day, 
As you've heard, for example, she worked with Jane Addams at Hull House in Chicago, trying to improve the lives of the poor and working poor, and learning about the particular issues facing poor women and their families. I know that we'll be hearing more about these dual themes in Hamilton's life from Dr. Korn, but I do want to tell you something about Alice Hamilton's long and collaborative relationship with the Women's Bureau, which I've just been learning about myself in preparation for this morning. For example, I'm just going to give you a few sh snapshots of a much bigger picture. In 1920, the Women's Bureau, when the year the Women's Bureau was founded, the Bureau drew heavily on Hamilton's work on lead to formulate its recommendations for one of its first publications, The Employment of Women in Hazardous Industries in the United States. In 1926, Hamilton was a featured speaker at the Women's Bureau's Industrial Conference, called by the Bureau to address the problems of women in industry. In 1930, Hamilton cooperated and provided scientific assistance for a study the Bureau did on the effects of vitreous enamel spray painting on women workers who manufactured stoves. I could go on, but given the limits of time, I want to share with you one story that I think exemplifies Hamilton's work on behalf of women workers and her connection to the early work of the Women's Bureau. In the summer of 1918, an employers association in Niagara Falls, New York, wrote to the Department of Labor asking for permission to introduce women into their plants and to employ them on the night shift. Under New York State labor law, women were prohibited from working between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m., but the association hoped the federal government would make an exception given the labor shortage caused by World War I. The Department of Labor formed a committee to study the request, and Dr. Hamilton, then at the Bureau of Labor Statistics, was asked to join as an expert consultant. Alice Hamilton and the committee toured the Niagara plants and investigated the hazards. They were concerned about the special effects on women of exposure to lead, storage batteries, and other poisons that could affect the reproductive organs. The committee was concerned with limiting the weight a woman could lift. And finally, the committee was concerned that women's home responsibilities, combined with nighttime employment, might lead to safety problems from what they termed exhaustion. Alice Hamilton and the committee found that the Niagara Falls plants had insufficient safety precautions, not only for women, but also for men. And they concluded that if women were to work in such hazardous occupations as those in Niagara Falls, it would only be under safer conditions. In the Women's Bureau's 1920 report on hazardous employment, which I mentioned earlier, they cite Dr. Hamilton as, quote, one of the foremost authorities in this country on the subject of lead poisoning, unquote. And the report goes on to list particular places where Dr. Hamilton recommended that women should not work, such as lead smelters, lead refineries, and storage battery manufacturing plants. The Women's Bureau report goes on to say, quote, these recommendations were made only after a careful study of all the processes in various industries. It is interesting and significant to note that even in the face of special danger to women in the lead industry, Dr. Hamilton has not recommended the prohibition of the employment of women in the entire industry, but rather that the industry should be made safe for both women and men." Unquote. I think it's remarkable that in an era when special protections for women characterized much of the effort at labor reform, Hamilton was searching for a framework that would balance women's need for access into the paid workforce with their need to work in safe workplace environments. She was also one of the first to acknowledge the special needs and issues facing women workers while simultaneously calling for safe workplaces for women and men. Today at the Women's Bureau, we try to articulate a similar framework, updated of course, a framework in which all workers, regardless of gender, race, age, ability, and sexual orientation, have both access to and opportunity in safe and decent workplaces. It is sobering to report that 75 years later, we in the Women's Bureau see women workers facing some of the same issues as they did in Alice Hamilton's time. We see an increase in women working second and third shift, often because it's the only way for families to increase their household income and meet their dependent care responsibilities. We continue to see negative health effects among women working double duty, first in their paid jobs and later managing their households and raising their children. Today we don't call it exhaustion, we call it stress, but we're still exhausted. <laughs> we at the Women's Bureau are also seeing new health and safety issues not so visible in Hamilton's time issues that are part of changes in the economy and in the nature of the work we do. 
We at the Bureau are particularly concerned with upgrading the safety and working conditions in traditional women's occupations where most women find themselves, and we believe there's a lot to be concerned about. A study conducted by BLS in the 80s utilizing workers' compensation data drew the following conclusions. A large proportion of the on-the-job injuries among women occurred in traditionally female-dominated occupations. Two-thirds of the occupational illnesses for women were repetitive strain injuries involving the inflammation of muscles, joints, and tendons, illnesses associated with various computer and data entry jobs. Work in manufacturing, mostly in food processing, accounts for 30% of the injuries suffered by women. The dangers associated with jobs in the service sector were also documented in the widely cited Framingham Heart Study, which showed that secretaries were more likely to suffer from heart disease than CEOs or executives. And a Johns Hopkins University study of depressive disorders in 104 occupations found the highest depressive disorders occurred among data entry keyers and computer operators. In the past, safety programs in blue-collar workplaces where men predominate have been given more resources and attention than those for office and service workers where women predominate. But in an economy that is increasingly service and computer oriented, this imbalance will have to change. Another new health and safety issue which appears to be growing at an alarming rate is violence in the workplace. Homicide was the leasing, leading cause of death for, from a workplace injury for women workers between 1980 and 88. Female homicides accounted for 40% of women's workplace deaths compared to 15% for men in 1992. A 1993 survey of 600 civilian workers by Northwestern National Life Insurance Company found that women reported a higher incidence of harassment than men and generally found that violence and harassment in U.S. workplaces is pervasive. There is also increasing evidence that domestic violence is spilling into our workplaces, workplaces where women are stalked, threatened, and harassed by angry boyfriends and, and husbands. Violence in the workplace is a complex phenomenon tied to social, cultural, and economic issues well beyond the control of individual employers. The Women's Bureau and OSHA are currently in dialogue on this troubling issue, searching together for solutions that will bring greater safety and security to women and men. It may, in fact, be one of the toughest issues either agency has tried to tackle because its sources run so deep in our society. If we at the Women's Bureau are going to take a leaf from Alice Hamilton's book, or pages from her reports, if you will, we will take on the tough issues of our day, from the stresses of service sector work to the reality of workplace violence. The poisons of our time may be less visible and quantifiable than those that Hamilton tried to eradicate, but her legacy urges us to continue to go where others fear to tread, to challenge what is appropriate work for women, to continually be expanding our notions of occupational health, and of course, to be an advocate for women and men in ensuring the safety of every workplace. Thank you.